psychiatry grand rounds. If you are an attending resident or a medical student who needs to register for CME credit or attendance, the information about the high mark system is posted in the back of the auditorium. The Grand Rounds Committee requests that you please silence your cell phone during the presentation. This morning I have the pleasure of introducing Ms. Connie Wells. She is a parent, a grandparent, and a lover of all things Appalachian. Yeah, all families. All families <laughs> Appalachian. So please welcome Ms. Wells. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to try to work all these gizmos. So is, the, is this recording working now? Oh, awesome. All right. Um, I'm so excited to be here today for a lot of different reasons. Um, number one, I've never been asked to speak at a Grand Rounds before and was not really sure what it was and whether you let people without a PhD in to do it. Um, so I was excited when Dr. Goodkin said, yeah, why can't we do that? And we made it happen. Um, and also because I know that you all are, are in psychiatry and in this business because you, you love the work that you do, and so do I. And as I told somebody last week, uh, how many of you know what, what evidence-based practices are? Yeah, okay. So as a parent, I can make your best evidence-based practice fail. I can make it not work. So, so can a lot of other families that you work with. So the whole idea is how can we work with families better so that the things that we're doing with and for um, their children or their um, adults with mental health issues, how can we work with them better to make sure that, um, that they're working with us? So here's the disclosure. I have nothing to disclose. Um, and I'm not going to have any financial interest in anything that's said or comes out of this. I'm with Tennessee Voices for Children, and we provide leadership support and services that promote voice, hope, and empowerment for the emotional, behavioral, and well-being of children, youth, and their families. And how many of you have heard of Tipper Gore? Tipper Gore actually, um, who is Vice President Gore's wife, actually started um, Tennessee Voices for Children years and years ago because of her interest in children's mental health. And I was recently hired on by them um, and am excited to be the regional director for Northeast Tennessee. I'm a parent of a kid who's now maybe 40 years old, almost 40, and she had a serious emotional disturbance when she was young. I, I didn't know what it was. I just knew she was a difficult kid. And so we um, didn't really seek services for her until the school gave us some services when she was in the fourth grade. And after that, I started learning more and more about it. So we started accessing services. At the time, we were living in a very rural farming community in South Michigan. And at that time, it, it, it was not cool to go around and say, my kid has a mental health problem. It wasn't something you talked about. And so I kind of grew up in what I call the dark era. And I'm so glad that now we're out in the open and discussing it um, and hope that we can even be doing that more. Um, I also work with the Mental Health Transformation Alliance. I'm finishing up a three-year grant that they have from the federal government. And that grant is to build the capacity of families in northeastern Tennessee um, to be leaders, to be able to access and navigate the services that they need, and to contribute in a very meaningful way to the progress and independence of their child. So one parent said, they tell me to do this, they tell me to do that. They have not a clue what that means to my family. And this is very true. So often our families will say to me, and you'll hear it in a video clip in a few minutes, they'll, they'll say, they told me they want me to do such and such. Do they have any idea? We don't have a car. We live 25 miles away. Um, we can only get a car on food stamp day, and so all the appointments are taken on food stamp day, um, making it very difficult for them to access the services and really follow through and be good stewards of their child's mental health. So where have all the families gone? Some programs in this area 
are reporting a 70% no-show rate for services. 70%. Family organizations often have no one show up for trainings and support groups. I've put in hours and hours and hundreds of dollars into trainings and had nobody show up. Um, and often a handful of family leaders are doing all of the advocacy and transformation. And what happens when we do that is Connie's version of what we need gets pushed forward, but we might not be pushing forward the needs of Jennifer. So I want to talk just a little bit about family professional partnerships and collaboration. They promote a partnership which family, youth, and professionals work together to ensure the best services for the child and family. They recognize and respect the knowledge, skills, and experience that families, youth, and professionals each bring to the relationship. When I said that I could make or break any evidence-based practice, I'm not discounting how much knowledge you have. If I didn't value and respect what you have to contribute to families, I wouldn't be here today. Um, but I do think that if we don't listen to one another, families don't even know how to listen to you, to be honest. We have to work with families on how to ask questions, how to know when to ask questions, how to know what to say, um, how to have the nerve to ask questions and say the things that need to be said. It acknowledges the development of a trust that's an integral part of a collaborative relationship. It facilitates open communication um, so that people are free to express themselves. So I would hope that if I came to you and um, said to you, I'm not happy with the services I'm getting, that you would be able to talk with me in a language that I could understand um, about the things that you, that's being done, why it's being done, and how I could play a role in that. Creates an atmosphere in which the um, cultural traditions, values, and diversity of families are acknowledged and honored. I really thought about this last week. Um, I belong to a, a congressional appointed committee that's trying to transform the mental health system called the ISMIC. It stands for Intra-Departmental Serious Mental Illness Coordinating Council. And while we were at the meeting, uh, they were talking about how they were going to get um, kids to keep from going into the juvenile justice system. There are some neighborhoods and some cultural areas where going to jail is not a big deal. It's part of their culture. They're in and out of jail all the time. Um, now, if, if when my kid went to jail, I was humiliated, embarrassed, I felt guilty, I didn't want to tell anyone, I for sure didn't want to tell my mother. Um, and, and it really upset me, but I, I get, Facebook posts from families all the time saying, yeah, they found my shit and I got to go to jail now. And for some of these families, that's all it is. It's just this in and out of the door cycle. So culturally, some of the things we're trying to keep kids away from are actually a part of their everyday tradition. It recognizes that negotiation is essential. So when I walk into the office to you, I have several things in my mind I want to talk to you about, and there may be a couple of them that are non-negotiables for me. This is what I want, this is what I know we need, and this is what I've got to have. Um, but I'm willing to negotiate on all of the other points. I'm sure you walk into the office with the same ideas. And it includes acknowledgement of mutual respect for each other's culture, values, and time. So it's really important um, for families to learn to respect the culture of the medical world. And there is a certain culture that goes with that. Uh, Family-driven means that families have a primary decision-making role in the care of their own children as well as the policies, procedures, governing care for all children in the community, state, tribe, territory, and nation. That is why I'm on this committee. I am the only family representative, non-professional, on this committee. Um, and it's because of this. The family of today is certainly different than when I was growing up. When he was very young, he cried hard for so long that his vocal cords were damaged. He smiles anyway. 
He was locked in a bathroom for hours at one daycare center and kicked out of another when he was less than two years old. He smiles anyway. The medication he takes makes his body twitch and jerk even while he sleeps. He smiles anyway. Some kids bully and make fun of him once they made him lick juice off the locker room floor. He smiles anyway. Each day is a challenge to manage the memories, the meds, the people, the twitching, the demands, the behavior, and still get a night's sleep. He smiles anyway. The smile lies. So what is family involvement? Families receiving services are supported as I was. Okay, you guys got hoops to jump through in order to be up here. <laughs> I had to fill out papers, I had to register for stuff, and I had never done any of those things. So I was helped by staff. They supported me all the way when I said I couldn't do something. They helped me with it. It was amazing. Families need that kind of support, and um, they need to be offered the opportunity to participate as full partners at all levels. I have a granddaughter who's currently at Michigan State University. When she went there three years ago, She's going to be a senior this year, so three years ago. Her goal was to become a psychiatrist. And um, she wanted to be a psychiatrist because she wanted to work with families and do something more than prescribe medication. This came from her lived experience as the child of someone who is very severely uh, mentally ill. And she spent years trying to find rides to school. Um, because her mom was medicated and in bed and couldn't get up. So it was her thought that if she could get out there and change the way we do things, that um, she could really make a difference. Now, as with many college students, she hits her senior year and she's really getting tired of school. So she's thinking about um, going into psychology and some kind of behavioral certification for a few years and then she wants to go back and um, get, get into med school and um, become a psychiatrist. She hasn't given up on it, but it's, it's her experiences as she grew up that has led her down this path. Families have to be involved in decision making um, if they're going to be more satisfied with primary care providers. And this is really difficult. I was telling Dr. Goodkin that are you guys aware that schools are prescribing medication for children with mental health problems? Sounds strange, doesn't it? The way that they do this is you go into a meeting at the school about your kid and they say, your kid's doing this, your kid's doing this. You need to get your doctor to prescribe him Ritalin, Ativan, whatever. Lex, whatever you put them on, okay? And the parent says, well, we don't really like, you really have to, because if you don't do that, I, I don't know if I can keep him in my classroom. So then the parent rushes into the doctor's office, and we're like, yeah, you gotta do something. You got, you've got to do something. I think we need something. And the parent push, 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 until they get what they think that they need. Therefore, schools in many different ways are, are helping prescribe medication that maybe we don't always need. Families need to be active in developing a care plan and are more likely to follow and maintain the care plan. I'm appalled that in this particular area, as different from Florida where I used to live, there are not community-based care plans that pull together all the services that a kid receives. You'll hear from Jennifer in a minute. Um, that kids are uh, getting services from four, five, and six different programs and agencies. And unfortunately, you don't know what the other agencies are doing. The other agencies don't know what the psychiatrist is doing. And so there's this huge dis disrupt. And then what happens, who do they count on to carry that information back and forth? Me. And I'm very emotional. And I pick and choose what I want to share. And it's not always accurate. And I don't always interpret everything the way that you mean it. So you might say to me, it looks to me like we're having some difficulties. And I get that far in my brain. And my brain stops listening anymore. And I start thinking, difficulties, yes, he's really having a bad time. I don't know what we're going to do. This is unbelievable. He thinks we're having difficulties. So what do I tell the next provider? The psychiatrist said he's having really bad difficulties. 
It's kind of like that telephone game, and it gets worse and worse every time I think about it and tell about it. Family engagement um, encourages families to be involved with their child, the services, and other families. And it ensures opportunities for families to have that involvement. So why do we need family involvement? Parents facilitate the interaction be between the child and the service system and as such represent the central dimension of the system of care. When children are the recipients of mental health services, primary care providers are often responsible for making decisions that support their child's recovery. Family involvement is a key element of the child's success, especially for children in residential treatment. I know the names of physicians in the area that if I want something bad enough and you won't give it to me, I can go to them and bug them enough and they'll give it to me. That's dangerous. That's a dangerous world to let me, who doesn't have the training and the education that you have, um, to do something like that. So it's really important that we work together. Um, the ISMIC that I'm working on um, has several recommendations. And there's a need for clarification and guidance re regarding the value and need for communication with family members and caregivers. Some of this probably sounds like, duh, we know that. But knowing it and being able to implement it with families that are going through some of the things that we're going through is very difficult. Develop standards that include a full spectrum of integrated complementary, complementary services known to be effective and to improve outcomes. Standards should be appropriate to phases of development and aging. Systems of care that provide family-driven, youth-guided, and cultural and linguistic responsive services. So if I came to you, I don't even know what good psychiatric care is, for sure. Um, I'm not really sure what it is you should do while I'm in the office and what I shouldn't expect you to do. So it's really important that we let families know very clearly, this is what I do, this is what I don't do. This is how you can help me get done what we have to get done. Family-driven means families have that primary decision-making role. Again, just because you want me to do it doesn't mean that it's going to happen. And if we're not working together and I don't have some shared ownership of the outcome, then there's a good chance that I won't follow through. <coughs> this includes choosing support, services, and providers. Some places, we don't have a choice of providers. You guys are a rare commodity. I hear all the time when I'm at these meetings in DC about the shortages that we have. Um, in setting goals, my goal for my kid may be um, that he can play football, okay, and not get kicked off the team. Your goal may be that he reaches a therapeutic level in his medication. Designing and implementing programs, monitoring those outcomes, participating in funding decisions, and determining how effective they are. Families that are respected and responsible can navigate the system of care. We can make health care decisions that will benefit our child. And we can advocate for ourselves and others. And we're partners with other stakeholders. And we can change the system of care. Um, <sighs> This ISMIC, my first meeting there, I was like, I'm just a token. I'm just a token. I, there's no reason for me to even be here. But uh, as Dr. Goodkin will tell you, I'm not a very good token. And so my hand kept going up and going up and going up. What about kids? What about children? What are you thinking about in terms of rural areas? Have you ever? That might work really good in Baltimore, but that's not going to work in the Appalachian Mountains. That's not going to work in the farmlands of Iowa. Um, and little by little, I don't even have to raise my hand that much anymore. All the other committee members are saying before Connie raises her hand I just want to bring up <laughs> so we can change the system uh, involvement I want to tell you we did this survey years ago um, to try to figure out what families thought family involvement was so we asked a group of families and they said family involvement is reading to their child tucking them in at night working so they have food going to meetings at school asking the doctor questions, and listening to them when they talk. 
But the providers that answered the same survey said that they thought that involvement included coming to meetings and appointments, speaking on behalf of the child, making decisions, helping shape services, helping transform the system, creating opportunities for families and their children, and being a leader. Wow, that's quite a ways apart. And most recently here, we did a five and five survey and uh, we worked in collaboration with multiple partners to gather feedback from families and professionals. What services are the most difficult for you to get for your child or youth? And families said the number one difficulty was therapy. And for professionals, they figured that was probably number five. Um, parenting support was number two. And behavioral health was number three and recreation, mental health. So we put both mental health on there and behavioral health. Why do you think we did that? Any ideas? It's not a medical thing. It's because families, when you talk to them, some of them will admit they get mental health services, and some of them will only admit that they get behavioral health services. And then professionals thought that the number one reason families didn't show up, they were part of that 70%, was because they didn't have transportation, and that wasn't it at all. Why do you believe they're so hard to get? Well, a family's number one is, I don't know how or where to get them. They're not, they're not available in my community. We do not have a way to pay for them. We're not eligible. I'm afraid to ask. So for families, that was number four. And for professionals, they figured families wouldn't be afraid to ask for services. I'm embarrassed. Um, I do not like the people providing these services. Family added comments were few services, not enough respite providers. Dental help is almost non-existent. Remember, this is northeastern Tennessee. It seems as if nobody cares about my child but myself. Sometimes I fight for the services alone. Professional comments were that some parents are just not willing to give up their me time for the child or children. Uh, time needed, one-stop shop, way to discover what's it available. Cannot get their children there, transportation, yet the family said that wasn't a problem. There are not enough providers to meet all the needs. There is currently only one behavioral pediatrician in our area, and it is nearly impossible to get anyone in um, as she is nearing retirement and then difficult requirements for scheduling, intake, transportation, and fitting it into the schedule. So which of the following do you believe are the most difficult when trying to get services? Getting people to understand what our family needs, and professionals agreed with that. Getting someone to talk to me that will not judge us. So mental health is a little bit different than having a child with special health care needs so i had a daughter who had an autonomic dysfunction and she needed to go in the hospital a lot and it was back in those days where babies were dying of SIDS left and right and she was on a monitor and she was on oxygen and she had a heart problem and when i took her to the doctor people in the community like literally showed up with cakes and casseroles but now when Lindsay had to go to the hospital for mental and behavioral stuff, nobody showed up with cakes or casseroles. And it kind of teaches families how their family treats them, teaches families how to expect to be received by the professionals. Dealing with the school is a big deal, and evidently professionals didn't think that it was as big of a deal. Feeling that my ideas and concerns are respected. Dealing with child welfare, understanding the words that professionals use, talking with doctors and other medical professionals, and sharing our family's customs, traditions, and religious beliefs. What do you think would help? Better information, a better understanding of how to know what we need, meeting with other families in my communities, which was way down the list for professionals. Um, you, you really underestimate the power of two parents looking at each other and knowing they've been down the same road. It's one of the reasons I love NASCAR. I love NASCAR because I can go to a race and I have the same t-shirt on as 200,000 other people. Nobody knows who I am or what I do, but I will tell you, I'll sit down on that tram and someone will sit across from me and we'll be sitting there talking about Jimmy Johnson and how he's going to win and they'll look at me and say, I have a child with autism. And I'm like, of course you do. 
Of course you do. Anybody could find me in a, in a, in a crowd of a half a million people. Um, so families do seek each other out. We do need each other. Um, a plan that lists everything we need and how to get it. We don't have that in this area. And I hope that in the future you guys will be involved in developing um, what we call family support plans, where we're not necessarily talking about just what does the family have to have in term, the child in terms of medication and when you're going to see them next, but looking at this child and family and what's going on and your experiences with them, uh, what do you and the family think that that family needs in order to keep showing up at appointments? Some of the best approaches. Uh, families do not know what we don't know. Most of the families I talk to have no idea what the difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist is. No idea at all. They think you're the same. Uh, many individuals are intimidated by medical <coughs> professionals, um, certainly by psychiatrists. Very little comes natural. It's generally an experiential growth. So when Janelle was born with a heart problem, and they came in and said, your daughter has a hole in her heart. The first thing I thought of was this huge bloody hole, like a gunshot wound in the middle of her heart. I had no idea what it meant or what it looked like. Um, so I had to learn those kinds of things. Families prefer to learn from one another. I will admit to another family that I missed his medication for two days, but I'm probably not going to admit it to you. Um, ask yourself, what are the barriers to family involvement? And I'm not talking about changing the system of care, going to Washington, D.C. I'm talking about being involved with you and actually having a back and forth conversation about what's best for their child and family. And ask families what it is that needs to change in the way that you're treating them. Be vulnerable. Go ahead and say to them, so how is this working between you and I? Um, you're going to have to be honest and be very brave. Some families are going to tell you without you asking. Uh, don't think for a minute that I don't encounter um, encourageable families, families that don't follow the, the routine. Um, and they unload on me, too. Um, you have to unload your biases. I hope after you hear the parents talk that you'll see that there can be families that are facing unbelievable difficulties and they can still rise to the occasion for their kid. Uh, support one another. So I'm sure that you get that when you're a resident, you know, you can go down to the lunchroom and talk about difficult cases and stuff like that. But when you get out into the field, it's going to be a little more hard and you're going to need to have some kind of support. Um, what are you going to do when you've been treating a kid in a family for four years and then all of a sudden you get a phone call and that child has died of suicide? You know, how are you going to get support to help you through that? Cultural considerations, balance culture and behaviors, uh, listen and learn from the families. Um, never go in with a cookie cutter idea that this is what the, this family is going to need. Uh, develop capacity and competence, create a sharing partnership get targeted training and technical assistance. How many of you have ever heard of Shady Valley? A few of you. Um, it, it would be a good field trip <laughs> for everybody to visit a family in Shady Valley. Uh, Shady Valley is up in the mountains, almost on the Virginia-Tennessee border. It's very secluded. There's a lot of inbreeding. There's um, clans that don't speak to each other and fight with one another. Um, and those families show you the extreme of what it is that you could have to work with. So my son's a paramedic, and one time he was going up there and had to go down a side road. Now, Shady Valley is beautiful just to drive through. Don't go down a side road. Um, if you do go down a side road and some guy with a gun stops you, tell him your last name is Johnson. Johnson is a neutral family name, and you probably won't get shot for that. I can't guarantee it but you probably won't. But he um, pulls up, they're on a call, and there's a lady supposedly um, having a heart attack, and it, usually they don't call an ambulance unless they're dead, so she's probably dead. My son pulls, it, it pulls in, and there's guys with guns, and the guys look at him and say, what's your last name? And he goes, Wells, get out of the truck. What's your last name? Johnson! 
okay, you can drive back. My son says, but <laughs> he's only an EMT. I'm a paramedic. And they said, he'll bring her out, but you ain't going back there. So there are still places like that here. Um, hit the challenges head on, stigma. Um, while we've been talking, two kids have completed a suicide attempt in the United States. Respect family views of involvement. Remember that for some families, they're going to want to be in on every little decision. They want a PDR in front of them. When you prescribe medicine, they want to know all the side effects, not from you, but from the book. And then there's going to be other families who feel like if they go home and read to their kid at night, that they're being involved. Create genuine and authentic trust circles. I need to trust you more than I trust anyone else. I have to have trust in you if I'm going to be able to carry out at home what it is that you're asking me to do. You've gone to school. You know what to do. I don't. Take an opportunistic attitude. Always know that there's a way to get through to the family. Apply a family-driven philosophy. Um, do what needs to be done and ask a lot of questions and ask the right questions. So the right questions are questions like, what do you believe we should do? This will get from, from them. <laughs> so you're going to hear things like, well, we've had mental in our family for a long time. Like everybody in our family is mental. And they drink moonshine to get the mental out. So you're going to hear things like that. We smoke pot. Um, that's why um, we have to do, you know, um, they will tell you things if you ask them questions. Um, and that's going to cue you into different kinds of things that might be interfering with the services you're trying to give. This is a family that I work with right now. Um, they're young. They're both 24 years old. That's their two-year-old daughter who is dying of muscular dystrophy. And she has a very severe form of it. She's in and out of the hospital every t few weeks. Now, I was trained as an advocate. I'm not supposed to get overly involved with families. And I've, like, way crossed the barrier with these. I'm, I'm too involved. Um, <clears throat> but that mom, she's 24 years old, and her kid is dying. And at the time, she was pregnant again and refused to have genetic tests because she didn't want to know if the next kid had it, too because she didn't believe in abortion. Even if she had no mental health problems, she should have mental health needs, right? No one ever asked her. She goes to the children's hospital every other month for a couple weeks at a time. Nobody ever said, are you having any, do you have mental health problems? Yeah, she's bipolar. Quit taking her medicine because she was pregnant. Now she won't take her medicine because she's nursing. Take charge. Develop a way of work that includes families. Create a motto that carries a message of partnership and acceptance and use it. Integrate family involvement throughout your delivery system. You guys have a lot of clout. You get out of here and you got a lot more clout than a psychiatrist in the school and even a primary care physician, believe it or not. You have a lot of clout. You will be respected for the things that you say, and I'm asking you to say things that will embrace family involvement. Utilize creative practices. Develop a strategic plan in your office um, when you have an opportunity for family involvement. Like, what are you going to do to get families involved? Bring them together once a month. Have families sit down, give them pizza, and say, so what's it like out there? Uh, establish out-of-the-box practices that will engage families and ensure authentic family involvement. Provide a shameless environment. It has to be family-centered. Too many offices look like this, crowded, um, can't move. Uh, I sit in the car because I'm a germaphobe and I'm scared that the kids will catch something. Uh, and have an open and trusting collaborative environment will make a, a, a huge difference. So if I come check in, and I, and I say to the lady, I'm Connie Wells here with Janelle for her appointment, and the lady says, oh my gosh, Mrs. Wells, it is great to see you today. That's good. If she says, all right, sign in. Guess how I'm going to feel when I get back to you? I'm not in a good mood. Families often feel out of control and that their life's out of control. Sometimes their idea of control is not participating. Sometimes we feel out of control and not showing up for appointment 
feels good. Um, make sure that you it, it model what, what the program should look like and, and make sure that you stay open to it. And that the things that you say, that you insert little sentences that let the family know that you appreciate what it is that they're telling you. So we have family panel. And I'm going to show you some videos first. I went to Mountain City. None of the families were from Shady Valley, but I went to Mountain City and interviewed a couple of family members, a family member and an advocate. And I'm going to play what they said. They're answering questions about who their family is, what they're like, what services they receive, uh, what are some of the best services they've received, what makes parenting their child difficult, and finally, if they could change anything in the mental health system, um, how would that look? Now, keep in mind that when they use the word psychologist, they think they're talking to you. Even though I kept saying psychiatrist, they would say psychologist. Okay. My name is Nancy Bailey, and I've lived in Johnson County 18 years. It's the longest I've ever lived anywhere because my husband served 30 years in the military. We lived in 16 or 17 different states and three different countries. I got uh, involved with children because I just loved them. And when I was getting my teaching credential, this <coughs> time the first special ed law came into being. Subsequently, I worked for the Army uh, in their exceptional family member program and was uh, in North Carolina and then moved to Johnson County and just through a fluke got involved on a purely volunteer basis with kids with special needs of all different now, why did I show you that? She's who you're going to have to go through if you're going to work effectively with families in Johnson County. She is the matriarch of kids with special needs. And if Nancy doesn't like you, families don't like you. Families will be part of the 70%. We have learned that in certain communities, you have to find a community family leader, and you have to kind of get them to vet you to bless you, to say that it's okay for families to go to you and get services. One that we, I have run into is uh, the, the problem of schools, teachers, the system itself, principals, uh, auxiliary people, not really having the, the education or understanding of a child's particular disability, not understanding the, the ramifications of that disability, and oftentimes not believing that there is a mental health component to that disability. The problems with that is the schools often do not listen to what a doctor or a, a provider is asking them to consider or to do. Then we have the whole medication issue, making sure children get it when they need it. Uh, um, and that is a, a side issue in many instances. But it cuts across all of the disabilities that I have been involved with, whether it's an intellectual disability, an ADD, an autism, uh, uh, a mood disorder. Um, all of them have components that are mental health and the understanding of that doesn't exist and the cooperation between the schools, the courts, and especially the mental health providers doesn't exist. Okay. So I'm gonna to switch to Dawn so that I give Jennifer plenty of time. So Dawn's a grandparent, and she has custody of her daughter's children, and one of them is a son with a mental health disorder. Okay. Go ahead. I'm Dawn Vaughn, in custody of my 13 and 14-year-old grandson that has ADHD, autism, fetal alcohol syndrome. Sorry, I talked that. Oh, and a mood disorder, and who knows what else. Um, I'm originally from Baltimore, been down in Johnson County for 20 years, I mean 18 years, <laughs> close enough. And 
there's been a lot of ups and downs raising Seth through the mental health stuff. I reached out for mental health help when he was 18 months old. What I got was early intervention program, which he didn't get help because he was two points shy of needing the help according to them. But at three years old, I put him into school and mental health because his violence continued to grow. And I put him in school because he wasn't speaking at three years old yet. Um, he has been nonstop in psychiatric care for 11 years now. The system we're working with now is the best that I've had so far, other than when I went to Baltimore and did John Hopkins. No one has ever taken the time to really get into Seth's head. Part of the problem, I believe, that nobody ever tries to do that. You can't just say, how does that make you feel all the time? There's more questions than how does that make you feel? Seth has a lot of deeply rooted, not just anger, but hurt, trying to comprehend his disabilities, and nobody ever tries to help him do that besides people like me and our friend Miss Nancy. And I just feel that the mental health has not really done much of anything. Okay. From the age of seven to 11, Seth was hospitalized nine times short term. Well, one time was two and a half months the last time. Um, all the other times were in five days, which, of course, in five days you cannot get deep into somebody's psyche, you know, and figure out what's wrong and even begin to try to help. They just up meds or change meds and made it all go crazier. And then when he was 11, he was in school and had an autistic meltdown. And he pulled out a yo-yo and took the string across his neck. He didn't wrap it around his neck. He just took it across his neck and said he wished he was never born. Teacher said she was afraid for his safety. So she got over top of him because he was laying on his back. And when she did get over top of him, he kicked out at her. And of course he did that because he was in a defensive mood. He had flipped the table over to go behind it to get away from the situation. So after that was done, they called me. I was on the way to the school and they still called the law. And the law arrested him and took him. And he was sent to juvenile detention at 11 years old with autism for 28 days in solitary, basically. And then I was forced to send him six and a half hours away when I didn't have a car at the time. So a psychiatric hospital again, because the judge was going to take him custody if I didn't. The hospital didn't want to keep him. They only kept him because they didn't want him to have to go back to school because they agreed, like everybody else with DHS and everything, that the problem was only at school. They were both severely traumatized over that situation. And I believe that the school should have some kind of responsibility in letting a court system know when children that are on a spectrum or whatever mental health issue they have, that that school, and it is a legal responsibility, but they didn't know it, <laughs> to tell them and tell the judge and tell the law about that child's disabilities so that they understand. You know, it's like now they're starting to train officers to know how to deal with people 
not just children, people, even adults that might be on the spectrum. Because there is a chance that you're going to think they're just being violent to be violent and that they can control it. But they can't. So how? So what I want to do now is turn it over to Jennifer. Oh, and you made me cry. I know. <laughs> I know. Sorry. And what I'm going to do, you can sit down if you want to. And I'll just lay this here, and then I know it'll pick okay. up. Perfect. Okay. Go ahead. Jeez. Hi. I'm Jennifer. I have three kids. Two of them have special needs. Connie asked me to be as honest as I can, so I'm going to try and do that. I am a recovering addict. I have my own mental health issues. I suffer from severe depression and anxiety. And I started self-medicating when I was around 30. I went through a few years of that before I reached for help. Some of the biggest issues that I've run into with my kids and their services are when you are on that poverty line and you can't really afford good insurance and you're on 10 care, you can only go to certain places. There's maybe three in our area that you can sort of utilize. And when you find one that you do like and the doctors there get along really good with your kids and the therapists bond with your kids well and, and everything's going well, it'll go well for a while. And, but these are like entry level positions. And so these doctors and these therapists are always leaving. It's like right out of school, they go here, and then they step off and go somewhere better where they're going to get paid more. And I get it. I get, you know, that's why you go through school and you need to make the money and all that stuff. But these kids get left behind. My kids' hearts have been totally shattered because they've lost therapists that moved on. And then it takes another year to find someone that they'll actually open up to again. Um, that's important. That's really important. Um, we've had doctors that my kids would talk to more than therapists, you know. Um, and then sometimes, like, like the 70% people are just no showing, not coming. You know, sometimes it's because you've lost that person at your provider that you can bond with and now the kid doesn't want to go anymore or whatever. Sometimes it's the parents are having their own issues. You don't know what's going on with this parent. You have no idea. You know, a lot of times they don't ask you. And of course, when I was an active addict, I wasn't going to tell you I was an active addict. I wasn't going to be like, yeah, I just came off a three day bender. Hi, how are you doing? Help my kid. You know, um, you gotta, but you do should try to not have the stigma and try and get your parents to be more honest. I'm not exactly sure how you're gonna do that, but it would be helpful. Um, so my son is on the autism spectrum. He's high functioning. He has had some really, really good providers. Um, he went, he, um, we, we tried Frontier Health for both my son and my daughter. My daughter has ADD and she's dyslexic um, and she has emotional problems. <laughs> so, um, you know, we've, we've kind of gone all over the place. The, one of the biggest issues that we've ever had is there's a lot of us, there's four of us. We all need services. We all need services. I have an eight year old who is like totally atypical, but out of nowhere, he's like starting to lie pathologically. Like he, something's going on with him. So we all need services. Do you have any idea how hard it is for all of us to get services at the same time? It's not easy to schedule that, especially at a 10 care provider. You know, they are so overbooked this year. I had to charge my daughter unruly. Do y'all know what that means? That means that I had to file the courts, get a judge involved, and tell him that I could not control my child. We're one of three states 
that still allow parents to do that, to have their child arrested for being unruly and incorrigible? So it was very difficult. It was the hardest decision I ever made, but it was worth it because they have bum-rushed her with services, which is wonderful. However, before the unruly charge, I had tried to get her therapy. She was cutting last summer, and I had reached out and reached out and reached out to everyone and everyone everywhere and, and gotten her intakes here and intakes there, and, and you do the intake, and then they lose your file. <laughs> and so now you're calling every week, hey, I need a therapist, hey, we need to see a doctor, hey, oh, okay, someone will get back to you. Oh, okay, someone's going to get back to you. We went eight months, someone's going to get back to you. And then I had to file her. I had to send my kid to jail to get her services. Um, things are a lot better now. I, I have a nephew who's going through similar situations. His mother is in jail. My mother is filing for custody, but she does not currently have custody. His mother allowed his 10 care to lapse. He has no insurance right now. My mom doesn't get custody of these children until the 21st of this month, you know, if the judge signs off on it, which hopefully, whatever. But until then, he doesn't, there's nothing. He needs emergency services. He's, he's trying to hurt himself regularly. He is out of control. He's going to hurt someone else. And the only option we're getting from DCS, send him to a group home. Send him to a group home. And t you know, we have to wait another week now to get that paperwork and then apply for 10 care and wait for it and then do intakes. Like, this is not emergency services. This is crazy. Um, he's going to wind up in jail before then. Um, I want to stop you for just a minute because I want to get work. We're at the end of our time. Okay. I want to give them a couple seconds. If you guys had any questions you wanted to ask Jennifer, um, she's the expert when it comes to navigating <laughs> the system of care, both for herself and her child. Um, were there any questions any of you had? Okay. So, um, are you comfortable with if Jen shows up at your office? and unloads on you, I'm a recovering addict, we all need services, I'm worried about everything. Are, are you about ready to be able to craft a plan so that whatever you do for that child's gonna work within the scope of that family? And that's basically what I'm asking for today, is for you guys, you have time, figure that out. Figure out how to do it for us so that we can help you. Because again, as I said when we first started, I can ruin any evidence-based practice that you throw at us if I'm not cooperative. If Jen doesn't cooperate with you, if, if she's uncomfortable with you in any way, you will not be successful with our kids unless you take them away. And you can't possibly take away all the children of all the families who are uncomfortable in your office. So I just and like she was saying about the community, my my daughter gets services from like seven different providers right now, um, and we're all over the place. I might have a ten o'clock appointment at an office, and then later that day have a three o'clock appointment at home, and then the next day I have another appointment with a different provider at a park, and like it's it's overwhelming. And sometimes parents give up because this is too much. This, I have three other kids, and I have this going on, and I have to have her here, 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 and here, and here, and no one's working together. No one's talking to each other to make anything easier, and, and, and after a few months of that, it's easy just to go, well, you know, how is this going to help? I'm, lo I'm losing my mind. It's just me and my kids here. It's not like I had other people to do these things for me, you know, so it's, you know, it's difficult, especially, like, when I was active, I would have never gone through with any of this. I would have maybe started it and then just fallen off because that's what addicts do, you know? So it's just important that you try to reach out to the other providers and, and see what you can do to keep everyone communicated with. 
Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Goodkin. I just wanted to say that uh, first, I, I think it's uh, an honor to have you both presenting, and, and I hope, Jennifer, you feel very proud of what you've been doing. Uh, it certainly is inspiring for me to hear your story of how you've managed to try to get services. Uh, and uh, Connie, uh, uh, you, you too, uh, not only for all you do here in the area, but you're one of those people who is going to Washington and telling them what's going on, mm -hmm. which they need to hear about. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. I wondered if there might be some more general statements you want to make about the importance of engaging families both for prevention of substance use disorder as well as treatment, and maybe particularly opioid use disorder. Uh, definitely. You know, we hear so much about opioids, opioids, opioids. and. I'm going to disclose something right now. I've been on Percocet for two years because I had, first I got on it because I had my knees replaced um, and then I got on it because I have a stomach and back problem. I have chronic pain. Every single day is a struggle. And it's very difficult for me to hear about how I have all these terrible problems because I'm treating my pain and I'm not becoming an active addict. Um, so you know what I decided to do? I quit taking it. And I'm just going to live with the pain because I can't live with the guilt. And I think that there's a lot of families out there that aren't that strong. A lot of people aren't. And I think that more honest conversations, we need to start asking parents, what is going on with you at home? Um, can you tell me more about what your family likes to do in your free time? If they say nothing, that should be a red flag. Um, you need to start saying to families, um, if you had an hour all to yourself, what would you do? Asking people these kinds of questions will help give you some insight. You're a psychiatrist, you're gonna be a psychiatrist, or you are a psychiatrist, you know how to interpret some of the things that are being said. So start asking questions that will let you know where the parents are coming from and where the people are coming from. Maybe they're like me and they're feeling a lot of guilt, a lot of frustration. Um, I have um, a son who has a drug issue and sometimes I worry that maybe it's because I made it look like Percocet was not a big deal. Maybe I made it look like it's nothing to worry about. Maybe I created some of his problems. Um, so talking to families, finding out how they feel, and then using that information. There is no way that that little girl should go in the hospital and could potentially die every time she goes and those parents not receive mental health services while they're there and after they get home. That's inexcusable. And so just involving, I think asking the questions, Dr. Goodkin, so few people ask us questions about us. And yet we're the ones that are gonna make or break the services our kids are getting. But people just don't ask us. Did that answer your question? Yes, and I think one of the things uh, that was uh, really illuminating in, in the presentation was uh, many areas where there are very large discrepancies between uh, mm -hmm. family perceptions of what the needs for care are and professional expectations. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a lot of... Professionals have some learning to do about that. Yes. There's a lot of parents that might even show up that don't even believe there's anything wrong that are there because DCS sent them, mm -hmm. that are there because a judge sent them, and they're not even following your orders at home. I mean, what are you guys going to do then? You know, it's, and then now this kid is suffering because the parents are, well, there's nothing wrong with my kid, but the judge said we have to bring him to therapy or we'll lose him or whatever. In this area, there's a lot of families on the cusp of losing their children because they're addicted to something, you know, and so they have to go through the motions to make sure that they, they love their kids. They don't think that they, what they're doing is a problem. It's almost like a rite of passage around here. The culture of an addict in this area, it's crazy. And 
they feel like they're okay. My, my parents did it, and my cousins did it, and my auntie did it, and we're all fine. So, yeah, you have to watch out for that. Yeah. And I, th I think that um, we need to always remember that the motive for coming to see you is going to be different with every family. Um, it might be because they want to protect their other children at home because this kid's hurting them. It might be a court order. It might be to keep their kids from getting um, taken away from them. Here's another one. It might be because they want SSI for their kid. Seriously. We know families that will come to you and try to convince you that this kid has a serious enough problem that they should get SSI. This is a way of them making money and having Medicaid. Um, and you're going to have to sort through all of that. And the only way to sort through it and help those kids is to figure out where the family is coming from. Um, and remember that their culture is going to be different than yours. And taking drugs may not be a big deal to them. I know little kids who, who are very poor and they steal their parents' pot and sell it at school for, to buy lunch with. It's just their culture. They don't, they don't think about it as being a good thing or a bad thing. It's just the way they live. Thank you very much. <laughs> wow. Go out, do good things, save all our children, and change the world.